Welcome to Real Grief, Real Healing with Mindy Corcoran. I am your host, Mindy. A friend of mine told me in early 2018 that she saw a vision of me with a microphone in front of me. I laughed at the time and said, I don't see any microphones in my future. Less than a year later, I was recording my first podcast on this show. I'm not going to say, I hope you enjoy this podcast. My podcast is not truly meant to be enjoyed. Real grief, real healing is just that, real and raw. I provide you an opportunity to learn and share in the grief others are experiencing, and then we share how they are healing or perhaps not. Grief changes each of us in some way. Many of my guests have been encouraged to open new businesses, start foundations, and in general, work to make the world around us a better place. Grief is universal. How we decide to move onward, seeking healing, is individual. A significant part of my healing comes through the courageous kindness actions of others. As you listen to my podcasts, you will hear how you can give and receive courageous kindness too. Together, we are better. Welcome to Real Grief, Real Healing with Mindy Corcoran, taking a deep dive into the reality of the difficulty grief brings and offering insight into the healing available to each of us. Today, episode 20, It Feels Better to Be Kind. And now your host, Mindy Corcoran. Hi, friends. Welcome to Real Grief, Real Healing. You will know if you've been listening to my podcast that in April of 2014, it's actually the reason for this podcast, I lost my father and son to a hate crime. A white supremacist murdered them on April 13th, 2014. And since that time, I've had significant grief, life transitions, life disruptions, but I've also had joy. And many times that joy comes from dear family members and friends. And one of those people in particular who always brings me joy, and sometimes joy through tears, is my Aunt Gail. And with me today is Gail Martin, and she is my dad's baby sister. She is the youngest of six. And I welcome Gail to my podcast today. Thanks, Mindy. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. So. You all, our audience, you're going to get to hear us just have a conversation as uh, really we're friends, and but I'm her niece, and she's my aunt, and we have a lot of history, um, maybe more than some typical nieces and aunts, because at one point in time, I actually lived with Gail and her husband and family, yeah. so I've, I've been intimately involved in their family as a family member, and I appreciate that. We loved having you. Yeah, thank you. We'll just leave it at that right now. We <laughs> okay. Maybe later we'll tell the story about the uh, washing machine. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Every time I do laundry, I think of that story. Me too. <laughs> okay, I promise the audience we will circle back to that. I promise. Okay. As we end, we will circle back to the laundry machine <laughs> story. And so... So, Gail, I I have prefaced you what what today is about and what this recording is for. So, I have a podcast called Real Grief, Real Healing, and we take a deep dive into something that has caused us grief. And right now, we're going to start with that. And I um, would like to hear your version, uh, your story, how you found out about your brother and uh, your nephew, Reet being murdered. And um, tell me about what that day was like for you. Okay. Um, so I want to add a little context first. So um, in November of 2013, I moved back to Oregon because my daughter, Sarah, was going to have her first baby. And Dave was still in Kansas City. Dave is my husband. Dave was still in Kansas City wrapping up his employment before he was going to retire. And on Sunday, April 13th, 2014, um, 
he was packing up a U-Haul and loading up the truck because he was going to drive to Oregon on Monday the next day. So that's my context for this story. So that Sunday, April 13th, Sarah and BJ, my daughter and son-in-law, were going to take um, their baby, Bradley, to the Oregon Zoo. And they had asked me if I wanted to join them. And I said, of course, I would love to. So I was on my way to the zoo when my phone rang and it was Dave. And he asked me, he said, hey, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in the car on my way to the zoo. And he said, well, can you pull over? And I said, no, I'm on the highway. And he said, well, then um, he kind of took a deep breath and he said, I need for you to really, really focus on your driving, which I thought was really weird. But then he said, Tony just called. Bill's been shot and he didn't make it. And Reet was shot too. And they don't know, they don't know how, how Reed is. They don't know how badly hurt he is. And I remember thinking that Bill really liked to go hunting. And I thought, is this some kind of weird hunting accident? And just as I was thinking that, Dave said they were at the Jewish Community Center for a singing competition. And some guy came in and started shooting. And I remember I just kind of, my breath was gone. Um, my mind was racing, but nothing was processing. And I remember I told Dave, I said, well, what, what, what happened? I just don't understand this. And he said that Tony said they were all at the, on their way to the hospital, I guess, um, because they didn't know what was going on with Reet yet. And they wanted me to be there. And I remember I made this stupid comment. I said, well, I can't be there. I have to go to the zoo to be with Sarah and BJ. <laughs> I thought, well, that was stupid. <laughs> but, but um, you know, and Dave just kind of was like, well, you know, I, you need to make a decision. You need to do something. So somehow we ended the conversation. I don't really remember the rest of it. I do know that Dave said he would call Adam, our son. I got to the exit for the zoo and I pulled onto the exit ramp and I thought, I can't go to the zoo. I need to, I need to make phone calls. So I found a quiet place in a neighborhood and I pulled over and I called Sarah first and told her what was going on and that I wasn't going to be able, obviously, to come to the zoo to meet them. I don't really remember the content of the conversation. Um, I also remember then thinking, I really need to call Kirby, our cousin, Kirby. Kirby, as you know, is a minister and she lives in Kansas City. And I really wanted to let her know because I was hoping and praying she would be in town and that she could go to the hospital to be with you guys. So I did call Kirby and she was able to go. And um, she also, I believe, notified a, a number of other people in the family, but I can't swear to that. So then um, I called, as you said earlier, there are six of us in the family. And uh, I called my four sisters. I honestly don't remember the content of any of those conversations at all. I know I told them what happened. I'm sure there were tears, but that's really all I remember about that. Um, and then after I had called everyone, I honestly don't really remember anything. I'm sure I watched the news that night, maybe online, because I remember watching you at the vigil. Mindy. And that had to have been online or on the national news, perhaps. And I remember when you made the comment about something good was going to come of this. I remember thinking at that moment, Mindy just set the tone for this. I have to catch my breath here. Do you want me to interject or you or do you want to keep going? I'll be okay keeping going. I just needed to take yeah. take a pause. That's okay. <laughs> well, let me you take a pause and let me say 
how important it is that you were going to be there for Sarah. And it was so important to you. That is why you probably said, I can't be there. I'm going to the zoo because you were in the place where you were supposed to be. You were supposed to be with your grandson that day. And just like my dad was with his grandson. So you you were doing right. the same thing he was doing, just in a different location. Right. And that's and that's probably that's probably very true. You know, side story, I remember having a conversation with Bill when I was talking about moving back to Oregon and because I was moving back so that we could be close to Sarah and BJ and be there when the baby was born. And Bill had told me, he said, I totally get that. That's why we moved to Kansas City. So um I knew I knew he totally understood that. So um back to back to that day. Um so I uh, the next day, I guess, is what uh, I'm moving on to because that's I really don't remember anything after the vigil, after watching you on the vigil. Um, I know on Monday I called my boss to let them know what was going on. And I know on Tuesday I flew to Kansas City. I don't remember making arrangements. I don't remember packing. I don't remember any of the details. The next thing I remember is walking into your house. And seeing you. I remember that too. I remember when you got there. And how we embraced. Yes. <laughs> like we always do. We all do good hugs. We always do. <laughs> we always do good hugs. For our audience right now, we are recording separately. I am in my closet in my in the in my house and Gail is in her closet in her house <laughs> and we're not able to hug. We, we did opt because of COVID-19 that it was still not safe for us to be as close as we would need to be to make the recording. So we decided that it would just be safer for all of our families and us to stay separate, but we have good hugs. I can't wait till we can <laughs> hug again. Me too. Me too. That's definitely on my list of first things to do. So that's that's kind of my story from where for that for that day. Um, How long did you and Dave stay in town after the after you arrived on that Tuesday? I think we were here for um, I was here for a couple of weeks. I think I, on, I again I don't really remember all of that is such a blur. I know um, we were here, of course, for the memorial service and. Um, for some of the things that went on after that. Again, I don't remember details, but I know we were here for that. We And we had lived here in the area for a long time, and we had so many friends and family coming over in support of us during that whole time. So it was, it was the right place to be. And, of course, my, my kids had flown out, so they were here too. Um, I think we went to a Royals game because Dave's birthday was April 19th and uh, we went to, so I know we went to a Royals game on his honor around his birthday with our kids. That's great that you had family time while yes. you were here. That's, that's really good that you did go back in time when you were in your, your home and your family was around you and, and you were growing up. Tell me about your brother, Bill. You know, it's, he was, um, he was, I think 18 or 19 when he moved out of the house, which means I was like five, six years old. So I don't have a lot of memories of Bill when we were living together at home. I remember we had a house, um, with an upstairs and the house used to be a duplex I mean, remember, there were six kids, so mom and dad had bought a house that used to be a duplex, and the upstairs room had a kitchen, uh, kitchenette, and a bathroom across the hall, and that was where Bill, that was his room, that was his bedroom, and I wasn't really supposed to be in there very much, <laughs> <laughs> because I was, you know, the annoying little sister, um, so I that's really the the main recollection I have of him growing up, which is sad, but the 
the cool thing was, was that uh, when they moved to Kansas City, when Bill and Melinda moved to Kansas City, uh, we got to spend a lot more time together and we, we got to learn how to be a brother and sister, but um, as adults. So that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. That's great. How would you describe my dad to people or how do you describe him to people when you're called upon to do so, like right now? He was Henri and um, he had, he had uh, no concerns, no embarrassment, I guess. He was not easy to embarrass. I will say that. I remember him walking around in his speedo and thinking, "Oh my, <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> mind you, mind you, this is not when he was eighteen. This is when he was a grown adult with children. Right, exactly. This was when he was a Popeye. Yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness, and you know, it it wasn't necessarily attractive, but he didn't care. It's what he did, and he was comfortable in his own skin. And um, I remember his his laugh and his smile because whenever he laughed or smiled his eyes got really squinty and um but he but he laughed all over his whole his whole body laughed um and oh he was ornery he would he would make so many jokes and and i also remember him telling me you know, that he was just crazy about Melinda. He just, he adored Melinda. And uh, he told me one at one point in time that he had wished, this was after our mom and dad had passed. He told me then, he said, I really hope that Melinda goes first. And I looked at him, uh, what? And he said, I don't want her to feel the pain of me being gone. He said, I want to take that for her. Yeah. I remember driving into the parking lot and seeing his body and literally in my mind I said to myself y- y- you weren't you weren't supposed to go first that this is not this is not supposed to be happening. And that right. and that doesn't at all mean that anything negative toward my mom. I just knew the enormity of what that would mean to her. And it has. It it has. Right. And um and she was able to tell her story, which um, I hope in its own right was a little bit healing for her. Yes, I listened to that. It was it was really it was very interesting to hear her perspective because I hadn't heard it before. Mm-hmm. So I enjoy you a lot, and I enjoy how you take upon yourself to to take you like you look at what we've been doing with Faith Always Wins and Seven Days. And you grab it. And I love that, that you embrace it. And talk to us about what you've done, either wherever, in whichever state you were in at the time, <laughs> that that you have done. And, and there's one thing in particular that I'm thinking of, and if you don't mention it, I'll bring it up. But um, I know that you have worked on acts of kindness yourself and and brought it into either your place of work or your friend group. Talk to us about how how you've done that and, and was it helpful? Has that been helpful to you? Um, it has been helpful. And I kind of did a lot of the things that I did without really thinking about it as acts of healing for me. And it didn't really occur to me that that was what it was until you and I talked about those things. But, um, the first thing I really remember doing, and I think this might be what you're talking about is, um, the year after the shooting, the first year after the shooting on Reed's birthday, I made fudge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for I had tried to make fudge before and I failed dismally. Um, the fudge never came out right. It was either grainy or runny. It was horrible. And I always threw it away. But that year, I made the fudge on his birthday and it came out perfect. And I've never been able to match that since. I'm going to try again this year. But um, it was it was really, really good. And I firmly believe that Reet was in there guiding me through it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And then and then I know that you 
in, in your workplace. That is the story for sure that I yeah. resonates with me that you did that. <laughs> and I was so happy that you um, adopted that and did that. And um, I may try to make some fudge this year as well. <laughs> and so tell me what you've done in your workplace. I think you've done a few things in your workplace regarding acts of kindness or sharing just the message about how hate happens and what we need to do to combat hate. Yes. Um, so first of all, ever since they became available, I wear the the bracelets, the Remember Reet and Remember Popeye bracelets. And um, I wear the t-shirts from the seven days events um, as often as possible. And I consciously do that because over the years, They've actually been conversation starters more than more than once, many times on the on the Max train in Oregon. Um, I've had people stop me and say, "Hey, um, what's with the bracelets? What do those mean?" So I tell them the story, and I explain to them what um, the Faith Always Wins Foundation is about and why we do seven days. And um, I share my mantra with them, which is, I think I stole it from Martin Luther King. Junior, um, learn, don't fear, love, don't hate. Um, because hate is to me, uh, born of fear. You, you, you hate things that you're afraid of and that's your, your defense mechanism, I guess. Um, so the bracelets and the t-shirts, but specifically at work, of course, everyone at work knew my story because I had told them my story. Um, but Together with a few other people, I helped organize several fundraising events for various um, for various charities. One of them was uh, Mascots for a Cure, and that is an organization. I'm not sure if they're here in Kansas City or not. I haven't checked yet, but um, people dress up as Batman and Superman and Spider Man and princesses and whatever else. And they go visit kids in the hospital who are um, going through cancer treatments. Uh, They also do something similar to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They they do stuff for the family so that the family is not left out. It's not quite on the scale of Make-A-Wish, but they do things so that the family can have some fun time as well, recognizing that those kinds of illnesses affect everyone in the family. So we've done that. Um, we also did a fundraiser, I think it was two summers ago. Kids, just like now during this virus, kids who normally get food at school during the summer don't have that. So um, the TV station that I watched when I was out in Oregon, the news station, And um, one of the grocery stores out there, the chains, started this program called Bag Summer Hunger. So we did a bake sale and a little, we called it a cube sale because it was a garage sale, but it was at work in our cubicles. (laughs) And we raised money and donated, gosh, I think we donated almost $2,000 just from bake sale and cube sale to um, the Bag Summer Hunger. And then we did something for um, a no-kill pet shelter. So if something came up and it felt good to us, we just did it. And we were very successful with that. And it felt really good. That's really great. Now, had you been that involved in different charities before their murders? No, not really. Um, I can't, I mean, I've, you know, donated money here and there to a I don't even remember which charities, um, but no, not really, so, not really. So then you would say, it sounds like you're saying after their murders, you felt this need and compassion, maybe a nudge to to help in a different way. And and I love that you helped charities that aren't even Faith Always Wins. I love that you reached out to who was affecting you and at the time. Is that what you mean? Yes, absolutely. It would. I I do feel like I was kind of had an awakening, maybe, that um, it's one thing to be that person who walks down the street and smiles at somebody and opens a door for them. Um, and, and that's important. Those things are important to do, too, because you never know when that smile is the only smile they're going to see that day. 
or if it means something to them. But it's also important to reach out to a larger audience and to help more people and to show that kindness is really the way to go. Kindness to me is easier than being mean. Um, I don't, I don't think I'm mean. I don't like to be mean. Um, it just feels better to be kind. It heals your heart. It does. Yeah. Um, so this, this past, uh, April, we went through the the COVID-19 and everyone was making adjustments and, and I had to make, and my team had to make with seven days, a lot of adjustments for seven days, make a ripple, change the world, our experience that we put on. And you were able to participate actually as much or maybe more in a different way. Um, Can you tell our audience what that was like for you? Yeah, so there are a couple of things about this year's um, seven days. First of all, I was in town um, because I moved here. And that was different because for the last several years, um, I've tried to fly in and be here for as much as I could. So I was really looking forward to this year because I was going to be able to do all of the events and volunteer and all those things. And of course, all of that changed. But um, I was still able to participate in pretty much everything, I think. I um, joined all of the events. They were all online. And I was able to join them either live at that time, or I was able to catch up by um, doing the, the catch up on that Sunday. Um, and then I liked the breakout sessions. We had breakout sessions in a couple of the events. And that was really nice um, just to be able to, to talk more one-on-one with everyone after listening to some of the presenters and to do a deeper dive. And I learned, I learned a little bit more about, um, Judaism and, um, Islam. I'm still, I'm still searching and I'm still trying to learn, but I did learn a little bit more about, oh, and Catholicism too, because I'm not really all that familiar with all of the tenets of Catholicism either. Um, and then the other thing, so instead of being able to volunteer, which was frustrating to me, not anyone's fault, but it was frustrating. Um, I baked cookies and I put the, I decorated them with the seven days ripple. I posted that picture on Facebook and it was horribly embarrassing because I have a cousin, Ginny, who makes beautiful cookies. And mine were, you know, I, I like to say that I showed my childlike qualities <laughs> with my. <laughs> <laughs> with my decoration. But you know, it still looks sort of like the ripple. And I included information from the website um, for seven days and Faith Always Wins. And we, Dave and I bagged them up and we took them around to the neighbors in our neighborhood and encouraged everyone. I did that the day before the event started because I wanted to encourage everyone to participate. Um, no excuses, really. It was online. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> come on, log in. Exactly. That's fantastic. I, you know, you, without knowing that you are healing yourself and probably healing many other people, that's exactly what you're doing. And I love that I've um, been able to draw from you so many actions that you took because you're giving other people so many ideas. So thank you for going into all that detail. Sure. Okay. So as promised, (laughs) we have to circle back to when, when I moved in with Aunt Gail and Uncle Dave, we had a conversation one time about what needed to be washed in the washing machine. Aunt Gail, do you want to tell the story? Uh, well, correct me if I tell it incorrectly, but uh, we were we were both standing at the washing machine, and I think you had thrown in some of your delicates. That's a nice um, way of saying my panties. Your panties, yes. And I came along and threw in a bunch of tea towels. Yes. <laughs> and you said, hey, 
you're putting your tea towels in with my panties. And I said, hey, (laughs) your panties are in with my tea towels. (laughs) And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) And the washer started. (laughs) And the washer started. And I, like you, every time I do laundry, I giggle because I think of that. (laughs) I do too. I do too. That was very fun. I love you. I love you so much. I love Dave and you and Adam and Sarah. And um, I'm just so grateful uh, that you're my dad's little sister. And cool. I'm so grateful that you're my Aunt Gail and you're my friend. And we love you. And you are definitely so special to me. And I'm so glad that we had those months together with you living with us. It It really... It just cemented a relationship that was already there. And I'm so grateful for that. And um, grateful for your family. I love you guys. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. You bet. Okay, friends. Thanks for joining us today on Real Grief, Real Healing. Signing off, Mindy Corcoran. Friends, thanks so much for joining me today for this podcast of Real Grief, Real Healing with Mindy Corcoran. If you want to dive deeper into how you might heal yourself or a friend, please pick up a copy of my book, Healing a Shattered Soul. Published on May 3, 2021, you can find my memoir anywhere books are sold. You will also find me in social media channels as Mindy Corcoran. Take time to help yourself heal. Accepting courageous kindness. Take time to heal another by giving courageous kindness. Together, we are better. Real Grief, Real Healing is copyright 2021 to 2022, Mindy Corcoran, all rights reserved. Our theme music is composed by Dave Croft and used with permission. This podcast is a production of 818 Studios.